Hi, I'm Dr. Raj, and I'm so excited to bring you the latest volume in my morning report series. This one will be ob Morning Report Beyond the Pearls. Elsevier, you will be proud of us here. So, this is going to be obstructive sleep apnea and pregnancy. This one is going to be near and dear to my heart. As many of you know, I'm a pulmonary and sleep doctor, and this is a very, very common thing that people have asked me about. So, let's get started. This is a 34 year old female presents for a routine second trimester prenatal visit, and you know what? She's feeling pretty severely fatigued. She reports that she is able to fall asleep quickly and she sleeps throughout the night, but wakes up feeling tired in the morning. This goes back to when people have sleep disorders, I always think about the two cues. The first one is quantity. Are you getting enough sleep? And once you say you are, I think about the second cue, which is what? quality. Are you getting good quality sleep? She feels tired throughout the day and is falling asleep on the couch while watching TV in the, in, in the evening. Stop right there. So this is classic. Someone comes home from work and they say, oh, I'm so tired and they take a nap on the couch. The family member says, oh, how cute. What a hard worker. No, this is odd. If you are work, sleeping eight hours at night, getting refreshing sleep, you shouldn't sleep the minute you get home from work. Maybe there is an underlying sleep disorder. Her pre-pregnancy body BMI was 32, which is already elevated. She had appropriate weight gain during her pregnancy. Patient report that she sleeps from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Let's do some mathematics. That is eight hours of sleep. She's definitely getting enough. She denies difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep. And why is that important? Because if we were talking about something called insomnia, you want to know if there's sleep onset or sleep maintenance, but she has none of this. She denies any atypical sensations in her legs. What am I talking about here, class? Oh, you said it. Restless leg syndrome. Should we worry about this during pregnancy? The answer is uh, yes. Why? What are some of those risk factors? Having multiple pregnancies and having iron deficiency anemia. And are pregnant females prone for iron deficiency anemia? The answer is yes. Why? Number one, increased blood volume causes a dilutional effect for anemia. And number two, the placenta and the fetus are sucking up that iron. So it's a very good question. Prior to pregnancy, she reports that she drank three to four cups of coffee daily. Wow. <laughs> and sometimes she would have a energy drink in the afternoon. Uh, good thing is that she cut down once she knew that she was pregnant. She has had intermittent headaches in the morning, but you know what? She just said it's because I'm going through caffeine withdrawal. Okay. Um, denies feeling uh, driving drowsy, which is good. Uh, falling asleep at the wheel, she denies that. And uh, she does not nap. Okay, I like that. Her husband uh, starts complaining that she started recently uh, snoring pretty loud at night. Uh, how cliche, you know, husbands are snoring forever and, and the wives are so tolerant. The minute the wife snores, of course, they have to go to the hospital and figure this out. So anyways, but this happens. This is not the first time. You know, I have friends that come see me that their wives during pregnancy, they notice some snoring should they be alarmed. Um, he reports that previously she would snore only occasionally uh, or after alcohol intake, but now it's being uh, pretty regular. And you know what the answer is? Husband, there is another room over there or get some headphones. <laughs> so big thing is, is what is uh, obstructive sleep apnea? That's gonna be a step one basic science pearl. So the key thing is, what does apnea mean? No flow. Flow of what? Air. No oxygen in, no carbon dioxide out. So if you have obstructive apnea, that flow is decreased greater than 90%. There's something called a hypopnea, and for simple terms, it's kind of like a wannabe apnea. The flow doesn't just decrease all, greater than 90, maybe somewhere between 30 or 50%, but is also associated with some cardiovascular risk factors just as apneas. And on the bottom of my slide, you hear something called a RERA, respiratory effort related arousal. It's kind of like glorified snoring. So snoring class can make you feel tired and sleepy during the day, but it doesn't have the cardiovascular risk factors. So when we talk about obstructive sleep apnea, you know, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. So I had to put in the classic stereotype for obstructive sleep apnea, Jabba the Hutt. But we know that obstructive apnea, when I say where is the obstruction, is not here in the gut, where is it? That's right, 
It's around the neck. It's gonna be the back of the mouth where the tonsils, the posterior pharynx. It's gonna be uh, you know, where the uvula, all those things. That's where the obstruction is. So it's not always gonna be that stereotype that we think about. So let's talk about a step one basic science physiological pearl, which is what are some of the things we should know about, about obstructive apnea up here in the neck? I wanna talk about two things. The forces that causes the, the upper airway to collapse and the forces that wanna open up the upper airway. So the first one I wanna mention about is called the Venturi effect. What does it mean? When you have a narrow area of obstruction like an obstructive sleep apnea, what happens to velocity? It increases because it's narrow. That gives you less force to open up the airway. That's called the Venturi effect. The second one is called the Bernoulli principle, which means when you have that narrowed area of the obstruction, that as velocity is increasing, it causes this force to suck in the walls. How do I describe that? Do you remember when you go to a restaurant and you're like sipping that thick chocolate shake with a straw? What happens? The straw is gonna what? Collapse. That's called the Bernoulli principle. Same thing with the upper airway, and that's why you get obstructive apneas. So let's tie this all into pregnancy. So why would sleep apnea get worse during pregnancy? So I don't wanna blame everything on weight. Don't get me wrong, you can get obstructive apneas in the first and second trimester. So how does that happen? Not everything has to be weight. So let's talk about the big three. Number one, nasal patency. So it's been well defined that during pregnancy you could have what's called rhinitis of pregnancy. The airway, the nasal airway gets very, uh, very tenacious sputum, very thick, forcing mouth breathing. This could happen because of hormones like estrogen and progestin. What else is that the airway we're talking about, it gets more and more and more crowded as pregnancy progresses. And there's something called the melon patty score that gets worse. And I'll show you that in my next slide. And the last thing is gonna be, what did I say during pregnancy? You get increased blood volume. So when you're lying down at night, all this blood volume will engorge the upper extremities and the airway, causing you to collapse that, that, that upper airway. So as I promised, here is gonna be that melon patty score. How do I look at it? I tell my patients to just do this. I don't even tell them to say ah, I just tell them to open their mouths and I gave a clinical judgment of how crowded their mouth is. So the best one will be class one as you can see and as pregnancy progresses in some individuals, you get up to class four which is almost obstruction of the upper airways. So step two, step three, clinical pearl, how do we diagnose obstructive sleep apnea? Well, the gold standard will always be a sleep study. When they use the word polysomography, that's gonna be an inpatient sleep study. Poly means many, somography means measurements, where you have EEG, EKG, you're monitoring all these things. And when we count the number of apneas and hypopneas throughout the night and average it per hour, if you stop breathing zero to five times per hour, and the AHI is less than five, that's normal. If it's between five and 15, that's mild sleep apnea, 15 and 30 is moderate, anything above 30 is severe. And here's a picture of a classic polysomography where you have all these EEGs for the different stages of sleep. It tells you if you're having apneas and hypopneas, it's kind of like the bells and whistles, the Cadillac of sleep studies. But I wanted to mention this. Nowadays, we do a lot of home sleep studies. Why? I always make the joke that you come take a sleep study and with all these things making you look like Frankenstein, no one sleeps during the study. So home sleep studies are very convenient and it's a lot cheaper. So I put this slide not to, to give you uh, goosebumps, but to say that there are different types of home sleep studies. There's type one, three, and four. And as you get higher in the number, there's less things that we're monitoring. So I know what you're asking, hey, which one does Dr. Raj use in his office? I use a type three study. I measure respiratory effort, pulse ox. I actually will monitor the heart rate, nasal flow, and hey, are you snoring? So back to our patient. She has an in-lab study, probably because she has good insurance, and her AHI is almost 18. So she has moderate obstructive sleep apnea. The most important thing is, how does untreated sleep apnea affect the fetus? So some relatively large population studies have shown there's an association with low birth weight, small for gestational age, and an increased risk of C-section. So you wanna treat it. So what a surprise, next slide. 
Step two, step three, clinical pearl, how do we treat OSA? Number one, lifestyle modifications. And of course, I write down lose weight, but of course, accordingly, these are gonna be patients, females who are pregnant. Of course, avoiding things, alcohol. And of course, there are some people out there that believe, hey, it's the third trimester, let me have a drink. No, if you have untreated sleep apnea, do not do that. Be careful of sedative hypnotics. And of course, positioning. When you're pregnant, of course, you do not wanna sleep on your back. Why? Sleep apnea, number two, compressing the IVC. So we'll definitely think about appropriate positional therapy. But the mainstay therapy is always going to be CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. It provides a pneumatic splint to open up the airway. And remember, everyone, CPAP is not the mask. Remember, everyone thinks the minute they get the diagnosis, you need to look like Kylo Ren, and that's not true. The thing is, is that you could choose the style of mask you want, nasal pillows, so it's beyond just having that big bulky mask. So other options out there, I think down devices is something to consider. You know, things here are gonna be after the pregnancy if they don't respond to CPAP. And look at the bottom right, I just wanted to put this for fun, is that there is a device called Inspire. You know what that is? A tongue stimulating device. Oh no, it's implantable, it has a lead that connects to the hypoglossal nerve that stimulates the tongue. And of course, for refractory, moderate to severe sleep apnea, I just wanted to show you that there are more things out there than you think. So let's go back to my patient. The patient referred to a sleep medicine attending, and we said, you know what, we're gonna give you auto titrating CPAP, and that I have to admit is ingenious. Why? It's because your weight is changing during the pregnancy, definitely after the pregnancy, and auto titrating CPAP will adjust the pressures accordingly. So whether she sleeps on her back, whether she sleeps on her side, depending if she's postpartum, it will adjust the pressures nicely. So she comes back, she sees you, she's sleeping throughout the night, and of course, the husband is happy, and look at the smile on this cartoon's face ever since she's using the CPAP. So let's talk about some step two, three clinical pearls. Pregnancies associated with OSA should be considered high risk. CPAP minimizes the core morbidities and secondary health risks as anyone who has untreated OSA. And the key thing is, is that tell your patients that when they deliver, bring your CPAP machine. Especially if unfortunately they do need anesthesia, they need general anesthesia, you really need to bring that uh, CPAP mask and let your anesthesiologist know you carry this diagnosis. And remember, anyone who has obstructive sleep apnea, be careful when you give opioids for pain medications, maybe uh, post-delivery. and. People always ask me, will my OSA resolve after delivery? That's a step two, step three clinical pearl. And remember that, yes, after you deliver, you'll lose weight. This is why breastfeeding is so important to help with that weight loss. And the severity of OSA may decrease. So definitely at some point, a reevaluation is 100% necessary after you reach your goal weight after delivery. So let's go beyond the pearls. I have four main things I wanted to say. Number one, the fact that when a female comes in during pregnancy and says, I have daytime fatigue, I think many people just say, oh, that's normal. It's a normal symptom of pregnancy, and that's not right. You definitely wanna look for underlying causes, such as in this case, things like obstructive sleep apnea. The third trimester is associated with the most significant changes in sleep discomfort, whether it be nocturnal urination, heartburn, back pain, nasal congestion. So. Be careful of that third trimester. And the two main effects of untreated obstructive sleep apnea is going to be gestational diabetes and preeclampsia. This should be motivation enough to get the right diagnosis. And one thing I thought was very interesting, when we screen for gestational diabetes, I think we always say between 24 to 28 weeks. Why? For my USMLE step one takers, my favorite hormone, human placental lactogen, will peak around that time. But if you have a patient who has diagnosed obstructive sleep apnea, you may want to consider screening early in this patient. And if it's a negative screen, then screen again appropriately at that 24 to 28 weeks. I hope you enjoyed this vignette talking about obstructive sleep apnea and pregnancy. I'm Dr. Raj. Check out my book series and my latest volume, OB-GYN Morning Report, Beyond the Pearls.